You're probably wondering where Pastor Deborah is and why you're stuck with me this morning. Um, blame it on Nancy. Um, Deborah is actually attending her niece's surprise uh, engagement party in Charlotte. And uh, on Monday night during dinner church, uh, I was in a conversation with, uh, with Nancy, and she reminded me about that. And uh, I think it was a Holy Spirit moment, uh, the Holy Spirit speaking through Nancy. And she said, you know, Pastor Deborah's going all the way to Charlotte for this thing and plans to come back here to preach on Sunday. And I said, and I kind of had this, so? And uh, <laughs> you're going to preach? Uh, but the Holy Spirit convicted me and convinced me that we needed to offer to Deborah a chance for her to spend some time in Charlotte with her family and rest. Uh, this is, uh, I don't need to say, she's a, she is a, uh, she's a busy pastor and she serves us above and beyond. And I thought she might even show up in here this morning because she tell me I got to be in church on Sunday. I don't think she's here, so I hope that she's enjoying her, her rest. Now, what happened to me on Monday night was what happened, she did, Nancy asked me to do this, and I've already got, I was thinking prior to this, all of the pastors or all the speakers set up for dinner church for the next two months. I don't have to worry about that. Man, am I comfortable. And then all of a sudden, I'm out of my comfort zone. And you know, one of the things that happens with the Holy Spirit, I have learned, and maybe it's one of the reasons that we reject the Holy Spirit, is that the Holy Spirit sometimes takes us out of our comfort zone, doesn't he? And by the way, the Holy Spirit is a person. You'll hear me saying he. The Holy Spirit is a person. It's not an it. It's a person. But look what the Holy Spirit does. Takes us out of our comfort zone, but then gives us a comforter so that we can overcome anything. So uh, through Nancy's words and the Holy Spirit, I am here. I'm very glad that that Pastor Deborah has chosen in these last this sermon series, the Gospels, and especially uh, the Gospel of John. Um, the the Gospel of John, to me, I truly believe that is, and we and we've had many discussions in my Sunday school classes over the years, and in Sunday studies. Too many times as Christians. We come and come be a part of a church and don't have any idea what we signed up for. Is that true? We don't understand what we have signed up for. And somewhere along the, our journey, oh my God, did I sign up for that? I'm supposed to do that? I'm supposed, holy what? A Holy Spirit is going to be inside of me? John, I believe, tells us, the book of John tells us what we have signed up for. As a matter of fact, most uh, evangelists in working with people that maybe don't understand the Gospels or understand what it means to follow Jesus recommend that the first book that they read is the book of John. I mean, I think the book of John was made especially for that. So if you have a family member or, or a friend that you are working with or, or having time with, uh, recommend them to, to read the, the book of John. They'll, they'll see what they're, they're signing up for. The book of John gives us our basic foundation and principles of belief as a Christian. Many of the commentaries that I studied with this say that if you do not... Take the time to comprehend and study and understand the book of John, especially chapter 14. You will be a frustrated Christian. And, uh, if you, and when you look at the words that are in there, uh, I think that is probably very true. Because these are the doctrines that we practice. And if we are to mature... By the way, as Methodist, does everybody understand? As Methodist, and the reason that many pastors or many people migrate to the Methodist belief, the, as Methodists, we are supposed to mature and grow in our walk with Christ. We're not one of those, I got it, 
I'm going to show up on Sunday. We are supposed to mature and grow. What do we call that? Sanctification. Sanctification. So as Methodists, that's what we are supposed to do. When we, when we have uh, Jesus Christ, our first way to receive the Holy Spirit is that we have to believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, uh, that he died, that he rose, he was resurrected, and he's coming back. When you believe that and when you have faith, you have been given the Holy Spirit. Do you understand that? You, if you are a believer, you didn't have to work for it through salvation and through the blood of Christ, you have been given the Holy Spirit. And what a gift it is. And what a gift it is. And when you do that, you now have a permanent relationship with God. You have a relationship with Jesus, which gets you to the God Almighty. Do you understand that? Does everyone understand that? Okay. Uh, and then uh, uh, G there's a lot of promises in this, in, in, in this. By the way, I did not choose these, these verses. Deborah did. Boy, we had a lot of verses today. Can you imagine trying to prepare? There's a lot of stuff there, isn't there? A lot of stuff. As a matter of fact, I've well, it's a good thing I'm not doing all the pages of notes that I have here. Oh, I forgot one very important thing. I have been told, uh, and oh my gosh, hold on, hold on. I have been told four or five times this morning to make sure, i, I got to have my phone. Yeah, all right. Melissa told me first thing this morning and four other people at nine o'clock, hey, keep it short. Billy May, this morning, as soon as he saw me, Marty, keep it short. Keep it short. So I did that this morning at 9 o'clock. Now, I've really put myself on the hook now. I've got to, I got, I got to make this. I, at 9 o'clock, I did it in 18 minutes. Hallelujah. All right, I did it in 18 minutes. I don't know how much. Deborah never tells you how much time you're allowed. Uh, there used to be a group that, that I used to speak with, and they told you if you spoke more than 20 minutes, you had an ego problem. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to keep this. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to start this right now. Uh, bear with me. Okay, there you go. All right. I was supposed to do that a long time ago, so I just gained some time. Uh, where was I? Uh, all right, we're going to be given a lot of. We're, we're going to be given this promise of the Holy Spirit, and uh, and, uh, and 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 the Jesus. As when you get your belief, you have received it. You have received it. Many people. And I've had conversations, uh, you hear uh, comment like, I don't understand, well, that, that person really does seem to have the Holy Spirit. I'm just, I don't understand, I don't think I have it, I, I just don't quite get it. And, uh, but many people have been given, you are given the Holy Spirit. Um, what happens to, to us sometimes as Christians, we get the Spirit and we stop right there. We stop. As soon as we have received that spirit, and um, thank goodness, the uh, the Holy Spirit convicts us. I don't like that word. The Holy Spirit convinces us to let Him lead us. So, listen to that word that is trying to convince you. Now, it's interesting that in, in, the, in this, these readings that we read, uh, that Jesus said, the world cannot accept me. Jesus said, made the statement, the world can accept him. And, uh, and let's, let's, why does he say that? Let's think about that time and our time now in the present. Uh, all the disciples were Jewish, number one. And, and at that time, not a lot of people had heard the good news. I mean, I mean, it was just starting. And so there were a number of folks who did not understand Jesus. Uh, and even today, there are a number of folks who don't understand Jesus. Here in this country, in the western part of the world, Jesus, most everybody knows who Jesus is. But in some parts of the world, people do not know 
who Jesus is. So Jesus made that statement, and these are all red letter words from these, from these verses, by the way, that the world will not understand him. And um, he, one of the things that when we have a worldly, as a church, if we have a worldly, as individuals, a worldly viewpoint, if we go by what the world says and not let the Holy Spirit lead us, because if you are of the Holy Spirit, are, of you, are, are you of this world? No. Where, what are you? Kingdom. I like that different. We definitely, we are part of God's kingdom. As soon as you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, did you know your eternal life starts right then? You start living in eternity right then. If we are coming to church, if we are coming to church and go out of here and do not have, be part of God's kingdom and part of the world, we are just religious people. We are just religious people. We need, as followers of Jesus Christ... I mean, the most important one, the most the important, most important doctrine we've been given, we need to be of God's kingdom. Now, does that mean that we ignore the world? No. As a matter of fact, when Jesus says the world, I think you really could see that as the people of the world, the culture of the world. Because one of the things I do know about this earth, and when I walk around and I see some of the things, God's creation is beautiful. This earth, this world, the water that's around here, the greenery, the mountains in Montana or Idaho, any, all of them are absolutely beautiful. God's creation is beautiful. So when we're talking about the world, we're talking about the culture. So if we're living out in the world, if we are having a worldly attitude, we are just religious people. We want to be kingdom people. As believers in Christ, your Lord and Savior, you have been born in the Spirit. And I'll use the word that sometimes reborn in the Spirit. It tells us that in John 3. We have been reborn in the Spirit, and we have faith. And when we have that faith, once again, the Holy Spirit comes to us. Did you notice in those verses there's a lot of repetitiveness? When you hear verses repeated over and over, what does that mean? Pay attention. That means it's important. It's important. So uh, we sometimes, well, he just said that. Well, he just said that for, yes, exactly, exactly. Well, you know, one of the things that the Holy Spirit also does for you, and it really does this for me, it reminds us about the teachings of Jesus. It reminds us of where we're supposed to be. I don't know about you guys, but I need to be reminded a lot, okay? I need to be reminded a lot, and thank goodness the Holy Spirit does that. Rejection of the Holy Spirit to me by a follower of Jesus Christ makes no sense, none at all. None at all. The Holy Spirit, Jesus has promised to send us a paraclete, uh, a comforter, an av advocate, which is someone that gives you advice. So, and I just love the example of when we're out of our comfort zone, the Holy Spirit comes to comfort us. So anyone that would reject the Holy Spirit makes no sense to me. Now, one of the promises that comes from being in the Holy Spirit is, uh, and it's in verse 27, and I love this, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Now, that is a kind of peace that is not a timid peace. That is a bold peace. And that is a peace that will take anything that the world throws at you. Jesus has given us this wonderful peace, and there, Paul calls them peace shoes, uh, 
that gives us the strength that comes through the Holy Spirit. We need to be kingdom-minded, not worldly-minded, when we're letting the Holy Spirit lead us. If you want to get an example of that peace and, and what it does, in North Korea right now, there are 100,000 political prisoners. About 70,000 of these prisoners are believers. Now, m most of them are from South Korea. The South Koreans are great evangelists. They're, they're, bringing, the, the, they're bringing Christ to the United States, for heaven's sakes. They're great evangelists. So in the, in the North Korean government, and if you ever have, we know about some of the people who were imprisoned in North Korea. Many have been killed. Uh, and most that have been released were never the same again. They're, I mean, they've just been damaged beyond repair. The North Koreans cannot understand why these believers are enduring what they're enduring. Folks, it's because of the Holy Spirit and this peace that is given to us. Jesus also tells us, if, as, if you loved me, you would understand. And, you know, I had, um, uh, one of the things that I've had discussions with in, in, in the Sunday studies and in, in Sunday school is, gosh, I've heard this statement before, I wish I could love Jesus as much as he loves me. You know, and, and, and it is, that's a good question because it, the love of Jesus is, is phenomenal. And every once in a while, I, I try to think of ways. Now, one way is grandchildren. Now, don't let them hear this, but I love them unconditionally. They can do no wrong. The love that you feel for grandchildren, y'all tell me. It's, it's unbelievable. It's, it's phenomenal. I tell everybody it's God's gift to us for not killing our own children, okay? It is God's gift to us for doing that. But this week, I had another example of it. And this is kind of strange, so bear with me. And Melissa, don't hit me. Um, this week, uh, I was in the hallway. And look, if you prepare for a sermon, or at least I do, I mean, I have papers scattered everywhere. And, uh, but anyway, and I was in the hallway, and Melissa was in our third bedroom, and she was ironing. And if you know anything about Melissa, she's a fanatic. We have iron sheets, we, uh, you know, the whole thing. But she's, she's in there ironing. But what was interesting about this time, she was standing in that bedroom, and I was on the other end of the hall, and she's ironing in a T-shirt and underwear. So I have this vision that comes to me, and, 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 uh, and, I, and I, I remember when we, were in our, when we first got married, that's how she ironed. And, uh, but I had this feeling come over me, and it was a feeling of what real love is. Here I am, I, I see my wife in a T-shirt, underwear, ironing, and I'm thinking 22, 23, 25, I remember that. And, uh, but a love comes over me like I've never experienced. And it's a love that says, thank you for everything that you do for me. That's an example of the love of Jesus Christ. Every once in a while, I get it. Now, I, haven't, I don't think Jesus was in his underwear, but, but the list was. But anyway, uh, that's an, an example of, 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 of the love that... God has. In, the, in one of the verses, you heard the term prince of the world. Who's the prince of the world, folks? Satan. Satan is the prince of the world. Let me tell you this. Satan would love to take the Holy Spirit out of the church. Satan would love to take the Holy Spirit out of the church. Folks, without the Holy Spirit, the world is dead. Without the Holy Spirit, the church is dead. Those are not my statements, but they're the truth. It is important as followers of Christ that we understand the Holy Spirit in our lives. So we've been given this Spirit free. Christ has given the Spirit. Do not, if you are a believer, you have been given the Spirit. Don't question that. You've been given it. So what, if you are in a, in a state of where is the Spirit and where is it working in my life? 
There are some things that you can do. Number one, you need to study the Word. Most people that I have spoke to, the best way to find the Holy Spirit and have the Holy Spirit work in your life is the Bible. Start reading and studying. Walk a life. Listen to the Spirit. Ask the Spirit to come near to you. Ask the Spirit to teach you. Ask the Spirit to guide you. If you're uncomfortable, remember the Spirit will send a comforter. There was a Methodist healer. His name is John D. Lake. And he was uh, born in 1870 and he died in 1935. You see, I'm turning over these pages. My time's running out. He was born in 1935, and he is listed, and you can look him up. He is listed, listen to this, a Christian Pentecostal Methodist. He wanted to be a Methodist because he loved the sanctification process. Between 1910 and 1915, he healed in his group, he was a strong believer in the power of the Holy Spirit in healing tens of thousands of people. As a matter of fact, he was able to, his, his own wife who had cancer, they were able to heal them. And uh, he is a, was a firm, lived in Spokane, Washington and died in Spokane, Washington. A Christian Pentecostal Methodist, imagine that. And he said this, in the beginning, man's spirit was the dominant force in the world. When he sinned, his mind became dominant. Sin dethroned the spirit and crowned intellect. But grace is restoring the spirit to its place of dominion. When man comes to realize this, he will live in the realm of the supernatural without effort. Hallelujah. Now look, that does not put down intellect. If you have intellect, you've been given a great gift from God. Imagine what a person with great intellect combined and led by the supernatural Holy Spirit can do to serve and bring others to Christ. So how do we do this? We become born of the Spirit. We have to repent, turn away from our sins. We have to live and walk by the Spirit and worship in the Spirit. Church, we are facing one of our most Interesting times here at St. Mark's. You know, this church has done so many. I haven't been here as long as some of you guys have. This church over the years has done so many great things. We've built a, a wonderful sanctuary. There's been a the family life center. There's been mission work done at this church. But now I feel we're being moved to revival, restoration, and it's not just us. I believe God has a statement, is making a statement and moving the Christian faith to a time of revival. I know that this time of discernment about disaffiliation is difficult. And a lot of people are hurting. And I understand that. It is certainly that my hope that we Discern with the Holy Spirit. Be what lets the, what, no matter which side of this you're on, you let the Holy Spirit lead you. But let me say this. We are commanded by Jesus to love each other. The church is not this building. We are the church. I love you. Jesus loves us like we have a very difficult time to understand. I just ask this of you. Don't let a denomination or an institution be what defines your love for the church. 
Follow what Jesus asked us to do, to love one another, to care about one another. I know that some may decide that this is not where they need to be if change comes. And you know, that's okay. It would be my prayer to anyone that is go and be a servant of Jesus Christ. But I would ask that we keep this strength, this love, and this servant attitude that this church has going. Amen? We're going to take a time of reflection. Andrew's going to pray for us. And while we are reflecting, I'd like on the back of your bulletin, take some time to reflect on these verses. And once Andrew is complete, maybe we'll, if you feel moved, share what you got from it.